is really uh, 200 years old to, to abolish uh, slavery once and for all. Um, uh, to begin, I just want to be clear what it is that I'm talking about when I say the word slavery, when I'm using the term, because in, in modern uh, discussions, when you hear the term slavery thrown out, it's typically uh, referring to one of two things. Either it's referring to slavery in the past, the very real slavery that, that existed in this country in, uh, up through the, the mid-19th century, slaves uh, who, were, who were brought over from Africa, who were uh, sold in open market. Um, it was once a legal institution in this country. Um, it was a crime uh, uh, against humanity, but it was not a crime against the, the laws of, of the United States for, for too many years. Um, and so we have in our minds uh, oftentimes uh, the idea of slavery being consigned to these old sepia tone photographs. Um, that is, co come on in and find a seat in the back, you guys, um, or, or up front, if, if you like, even better. Um, that, is, that is one form of, of uh, slavery that, that comes to our mind. But the other, the other instance that we hear the, where we hear the word um, is as a metaphor. Um, some of you guys may have heard of uh, Albert Hainsworth, um, who uh, uh, is a professional football player in the NFL, um, and he was, a, uh, he was an all-pro tackle um, with, the, with the Redskins. When he, he said, he complained that, um, that his multi-million dollar a year contract shouldn't oblige him to play in the 3-4 defense. He wanted to be playing in, th in the 4-3 defense. And he said, um, they're, they're treating me like a slave. This is, this is modern day slavery. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about are people who are forced to work, held through fraud, under threat of violence, for no pay beyond subsistence. These are people that cannot walk away from their jobs. This is no metaphor. This is no historic relic. This is something that is today more prevalent than at any point in human history. There are more slaves on earth today than at any point in human history. And so you immediately ask, well, where are these slaves? Because at the time that my ancestors in this country who were slaves, I'm oh, sorry, who were abolitionists, um, joined with slaves who were resisting their bondage. Um, my ancestors stood on soapboxes in, in Connecticut and railed against the traffic in men body, as they called it. They eventually picked up arms in the Civil War and fought with Grant's army. Um, in those days, you could see slavery out in the open. You could go to the American South and you could witness a slave auction. Uh, the question for us today is, if there are more slaves today than ever before, where are they? And the answer is everywhere and nowhere. Uh, if you were to plot, plot slaves on a map, the, the vast majority of pins you'd have to put in South Asia, on the Indian subcontinent. You'd have to put um, more pins in India than any other, any other country. These are slaves who are held in what the United Nations, um, United Nations has this amazing ability to clean up, um, to sanitize crimes against humanity um, by using language. For example, uh, genocide becomes ethnic cleansing. The slave trade becomes human trafficking. And uh, this type of slavery that's practiced in South Asia becomes collateralized generational debt bondage, which in no way reveals the horror of what it is to be forced to work in a quarry for a, a debt that was taken by your grandfather of 62 cents. And to be unable to walk away under threat of sheer violence. And I'm now talking about one particular individual. You know, uh, too often um, we, we forget that behind these numbers there are real lives. And so what I attempted to do when I spent five years 
traveling the globe and, and going undercover when necessary um, to, to document the modern day slave trade is to find these stories of slaves, of survivors, of traffickers and, and to bring those to all of you to put a human face on the, on the statistics. And this individual that I'm referring to in India whose grandfather had taken a debt of 62 cents was forced to work every day, every day of the week from before sunup to after sundown uh, with his entire family. Um, they were forced to pay off a debt that the grandfather had taken uh, of 62 cents and three generations and three slave masters later uh, this man and his children were forced to blast rocks out of the earth and that the children would go in and plant the blasting explosives to, to bla blast these rocks out. Um, and uh, as you can imagine, the, the mortality rate and the injury rate was extremely high when you're talking about a seven-year-old going in and, and lighting a short fuse. Um, when these rocks came up out of the earth, they descended, the whole village would descend on the rocks with pikes and mortars, and they would break up these rocks into gravel, which was then turned into the subgrade for, for India's roads. And then they would further pulverize that gravel into sand, into silica sand, which is a, a, an element in the manufacture of glass. And there's only one way in the modern world that you can turn a profit off of handmade sand, and that's through slavery. And the individual who forced them to, to work in this quarry and his brothers had become the most powerful people in this village uh, and in the surrounding area. They, they were known by local police to be the sand mafias. Um, and the sand mafias exerted their power through sheer unmitigated violence. They would do drive-by shootings of rival contractors. They would, um, they would summarily kill slaves. They were known by local police to have killed uh, this individual, I should say one individual, um, who, was, who was the owner of this man who I call Ganu. I've changed his name because as far as I know, he's still in slavery and he's still in jeopardy. They were known, uh, he was known by local police to have killed four high caste Brahmin caste Indians. These were Indians whose deaths registered. The slaves he would kill in a profligate uh, fashion. He would, he would do it without any reporting of, of those murders to the police. And, as, and according to the, to the slaves, he'd killed upwards of a dozen slaves, including men, women, and children. So when you begin to understand, when you begin to understand what modern day slavery is and how it continues to exist, you have to first of all understand the sheer violence that, that underpins it. But you also have to understand another vexing element of this. Because when I went to, um, when I went to interview this fellow, I would slip in at night and I would go in without the, the quarry owner is noticing me, and I would go into his jopari, into his hut, and we would, we would sit by the fire and we would talk. And I said, you know, if I can come in, why, why don't you go out? Nobody's holding you in chains here. And the first thing that he said was, no matter where I go, Ramesh, the name of his um, slave master, will find me. Um, and then beyond that, um, at, let's say I did get away, let's say my family could get away, how would I eat? Uh, what, would, uh, what, would my, what would I do for a living? How would I feed my family? When I was traveling around India, and I, would, I, I traveled all around India looking at different, different forms of slavery, I, was, uh, I would travel on trains and I was reading the writings of Mahatma Gandhi. And Gandhi had a a beautiful, eloquent phrase where he was describing the difference between freedom and slavery. And he said, freedom and slavery are mental constructs. When a slave decides not to be a slave, the bond is snapped and the fetters fall. It, again, was a beautiful phrase. But when I heard that response from Ganu, how would I eat? Where would I go? It became clear to me that the reason why slavery persists today is because slavery for Ganu and for millions of others is no mere mental construct. 
Slavery is his world, and Ramesh is God in that world. He is, he is the taker of life, but he's also the giver of sustenance. And so as we think about the ways to eradicate slavery, we have to first and foremost think about breaking through that cycle of dependence, breaking through those bonds. We botched our emancipation in this country. We, we took 3.5 million people who were hitherto had uh, no rights under law save that of property, and we dumped them onto a con an, an economy with no, um, no comprehensive retraining for how they could survive in, in, the, new, uh, in the new America uh, as citizens of the new America. Um, we did not protect their rights. And so what happened over the course of the, the following 160 years in terms of race relations in this country, also in terms of the re-enslavement of Southern blacks in the late 19th century, was a direct result of that botched emancipation. We're paying the price for that botched emancipation today. And so as we think about abolishing slavery in countries like India and in countries like our own, and I'll get to that in a second, we have to think about doing it right this time and making sure that that emancipation doesn't stop at emancipation, but it leads to sustained and sustainable freedom. As I mentioned, India, South Asia, is not the only uh, uh, region on Earth that has slavery. According to the U.S. State Department, there are between 600 and 800,000 that are trafficked across international borders each and every year trafficked, which is another term, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, for it's a euphemism for slave trading. Um, it's, it's the process of recruitment. It's the process of transportation, the process of harboring individuals for the purposes of extracting their, their labor for free. Um, it, it involves violence or the threat of violence. Um, it involves fraud. It involves coercion into this country on an annual basis, according to, the, uh, according to the, the U.S. State Department and the Justice Department, there are between 14,000 and 17,000 that are trafficked each and every year. So I've been talking for a little short of, of half an hour now. On average, in that half an hour, as I'm sitting here talking to you, one more person will have become a slave right here in the United States. It happens, it happens in Texas. Last year, 120 slaves were freed in the Houston area, um, thanks to, I think, some of the best uh, law enforcement practices in the country. Um, Texas is, is both a hub of human trafficking, um, of slavery, and also, um, as Bob was mentioning at the beginning of class, uh, has taken, I think, uh, uh, a leadership role in the country in terms of pushing back against slavery, in terms of liberating slaves. Um, but as I'm talking here, and as I mentioned earlier, there is, there is a tendency when we talk about this issue, when activists talk about this issue, to get caught up in the numbers. And, uh, and the numbers are important. We need to have a better understanding of, of get our arms around how many slaves there are um, in any given region and writ large. But there's a danger in focusing too much on the numbers, which is that we forget the, the humanity of the individuals that are suffering from this crime. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's the, it's the worst people who, uh, who oftentimes come up with the best quotes. And Joseph Stalin uh, was supposed to have said, that the death of a, of a million men is a statistic, but the death of one man is a tragedy. <clears throat> and what I set out to do with the book um, is to find one slave, um, one man, one woman, one child in slavery and tell the tragedy of their lives, to, to, to find survivors as well, and to tell the hope of their struggle. Um, also, what I in, set out to do was to find uh, traffickers, and this was, um, and to talk to traffickers. And this was one of these challenges um, that, when I set out to write the book in in the beginning of uh, 
uh, of uh, essentially in 2002, um, it hadn't really been done before. And part of the reason why it hadn't been done is most human traffickers are not eager to talk to you. Um, these, are, these are individuals who um, are not only violating, in many cases, state laws or national laws, they're violating, uh, they're violating international laws. They're committing crimes against humanity. And you can't go to their publicist and say, you know, I'd like to talk to your client about these monstrous deeds he's, he's committing. Um, and so in some cases, I had to toe the line uh, in terms of ethical journalism and go undercover. And I justified that by the, the fact that I could not get the information uh, from many of these individuals. I could not get their side of the story um, if I came forward and said, I'm, I'm a journalist. I didn't like to do that, however. And um, in, the, in the four instances, uh, actually five by now, um, that I was able to witness negotiations for the sale of human beings, uh, in not all of those instances did I have to go undercover. And let's say, for the purposes of our discussion here, that we're, we're in the center of the moral universe. Let's say that um, you know, we here in Texas, uh, as I've just said, you know, Texas is, I think, leading the fight in the vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis the, the rest of the country in terms of fighting slavery. Um, let's say that, that we all agree um, that, that slavery is a, uh, is a crime against humanity. Well, some five hours, in fact, probably less than that, some four hours from where we are, um, six years ago, just six years ago, I was able to negotiate in broad daylight for the sale of a 12-year-old girl. And the individual who offered to sell me this girl was um, talking to me with full knowledge that I was a journalist. Uh, this was on the street in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, less than an hour from Toussaint Leoverture Airport, the main airport there. Um, I pulled up in front of a barber shop, and in front of this barber shop, there were four men standing. Uh, I rolled down uh, the window of the car that I was in. One of them came over and said, do you want to get a person? The individuals that were standing in front of that barbershop did one thing. And everybody in the neighborhood knew what they did. Uh, they called themselves coutiers. They called themselves brokers. Um, and the commodity that they were brokering was human beings, was in this case children. Uh, according to UNICEF, um, prior to the earthquake, there were between 175,000 and 300,000 child slaves in, in Haiti. Um, the term that the Haitians employ, and this is again another, another euf euphemism, is restavec, which uh, is a, a, a nice word for a very nasty practice that is oftentimes brutal domestic slavery. These are um, what this broker that I was talking to would do is he would go up into the highlands of southern Haiti. Uh, he would go to rural areas where, where families would have, in some cases, eight, nine children. And he would go to them, and, and they would be suffering from withering poverty. They couldn't send these children to school. There were no schools. In, there are no schools in, in uh, a vast majority of, of rural villages in Haiti. And he would go to them, and he would say, Mommy, Poppy, I know, I know that you're, you're suffering. I know that you're, um, uh, your children can't go to school. I, I, can, I can give these children food. I can give these children new clothes. Uh, and, and I can give these children school if you will send just one or two of these children with me um, in exchange for some light labor. And it's always the light labor um, that should be the tip-off but never is. Um, uh, in exchange for some light labor, um, I'll, be, I'll take care of your children and, and give them a chance. And imagine that you're in this situation. You know, we hear oftentimes in the media when, uh, in the few instances that you may have heard about modern day slavery, you hear about parents selling their children. I've never actually encountered uh, a parent who ever took money for their children. I've never encountered a parent who who sold their children in that sense. I know they exist in theory. I've just never met them. What I have encountered 
in case after case, is a parent who will make a devil's choice between watching their child slowly starve or die of dehydration or giving their child away to a human trafficker who never identifies themselves as a human trafficker, never even identifies themselves as a coutier in those instances, just says, I'm an ami, I'm a, I'm a friend. Um, and a parent will make that devil's choice to give that child to that trafficker versus the, the certain fate of watching that child slowly die. It's the traffickers that use the most venal leverage, the love of a parent for a child, to, to pry that child from their parents. And at the other end of the transaction, you have me on the street there in Port-au-Prince talking to this broker. And we were having a, a very mundane conversation. And I, it was, it was, I live in New York City. Uh, I lived in Brooklyn for 10 years. And at the time, I was living in Brooklyn. And this is the kind of conversation that I might have on Canal Street if I was negotiating over a used stereo. And it was for a 12-year-old girl. And the explicit use of this girl was going to be, I said I wanted her to cook. I said I wanted her to clean, to carry water, um, to basically be a domestic servant. And I said I wouldn't pay this child. And after I made it clear that I wanted this child for a, uh, for a uh, domestic slave and I wanted this child uh, to be a 12-year-old girl, the trafficker leaned in and he said, this is rather a delicate question, but would you want this child as a partner as well as a domestic slave? And my translator made it perfectly clear what he meant by partner. And according to the UN study on these child slaves, again, as high as as many as 300,000 prior to the earthquake, sexual abuse is part and parcel of their bondage. There, there's something, again, an, another euphemism, Creole euphemism, the Pusa'a phenomenon, which is the there for that phenomenon. And that's part of what these children are used for. So it, we got to the point in the negotiation where we were talking price. And the asking price for, for this child um, was 100 US dollars to be used as a domestic and a sexual slave. And the negotiated price within five minutes was 50 US dollars. Now, I want to put that in context very briefly. Um, in the American South, in the early part of the 19th century, um, a, a healthy adult male um, would be sold at open auction uh, on average for about $40,000 in today's dollars. Um, that individual was sold as a piece of property. That individual was dehumanized. That human was degraded. This, this was an absolutely monstrous crime then as it is now. But the valuation of that individual was such that in, in many cases, the, the, the owners would view that person, not in, perhaps not as a person, but as a valuable piece of property, so, uh, and, and would take some concern over their upkeep. When a child costs $50 less than five hours from where we are, that child is eminently disposable. That child can be replaced, and that, ch that child can be discarded and replaced with, with little concern for, for the economic impact. I should say that um, the, uh, in terms of the negotiations that I'd done, in terms of the, the, um, the investigations that I've done, um, that was not the cheapest I'd been offered uh, I'd been offered a human being. Um, and as I said at the beginning, I, I'm going to show some uh, pictures, which I don't normally do, but I think it's important to, to really drive home what it is that I'm talking about and, and the effect on human life um, that slavery has. Um, the, the summer before the World Cup in South Africa, 
I, I went on assignment for Time Magazine um, to infiltrate Nigerian human trafficking networks that were, um, they'd uh, originally set up shop in South Africa, in, in eastern South Africa, um, along the corridor between Port Elizabeth and Bloemfontein, including Johannesburg. Um, and their original commodity was crack. Um, and they, they built up a lot of capital selling crack. And then at a certain point, um, when the South African government and the South African police service um, began to crack down hard on crack, um, they rolled their profits into a safer commodity. Safer meaning less likely to be um, prosecuted, less likely to incur police investigations. And that commodity was human beings. Uh, to date, there is no standalone law against human trafficking in South Africa. And so uh, these, uh, these networks would sell human beings, um, they would recruit, they would entrap, and they would uh, sell human beings uh, uh, from uh, one another to the network, and they would rent these human beings on the street for sex. And in many cases, these, these human beings were girls. They were underage girls. And in a country where the HIV infection rate in the general population hovers around 20 percent. The end game for these girls was was pretty grim, and um, I, I'm, I'll set up the picture that I'm about to show you just with a, a brief vignette. This was Friday night. Um, it was uh, it was the summer before, which means their winter. Um, uh, it was freezing cold. This was in Bloemfontein, South Africa. Um, what I'm about to show you is in a state-run hospice. Um, and the individual that I was talking to, the girl that I was talking to, was 16 years old. Um, she had been sold by a, um, uh, uh, she had been recruited from her township in um, uh, outside of Port Elizabeth, and she had been uh, lured to Bloemfontein with promises of a job um, as a maid. Um, when she got to Bloemfontein, she was sold for $35 and a bag of crack. Um, she and her best friend, I should say, were sold for $35 and a bag of crack, $35 each, $70 total. Um, to a, uh, a trafficker. The recruiter took the bag of crack and took the money and disappeared. And for the, the, the next year and a half, they were forced by this brutal trafficker to sleep with um, as many as, as eight clients a day. Um, and they were, uh, if the client didn't want to use protection, then they had to consent. So they were forced to, to sleep with these clients without, without protection. And the end game is um, this right here. I should say, as a preface to this, uh, I rarely show the faces of human trafficking victims. Um, I'll explain why uh, I showed, uh, I made an exception for Sindiswa here uh, by saying that um, I asked my photographer to have her turn her her face away, and she insisted on having her face shown, and she insisted that I use her real first name. And what she said was that she wanted the world to remember her. She wanted somebody to remember her. Um, uh, despite that fact, we didn't run uh, her photograph in Time Magazine because she was a minor. But um, she had been kicked out of the the um, the brothel that she was uh, uh, where she was forced to work a week earlier, um, and a, a good Samaritan had taken her to the hospital. The hospital had very quickly um, decided that there was no treatment that could save her, and so they put her into the state-run hospital, sorry, hospice. Um, and when I found her on a Friday night, um, we were the first people to have visited her. She 
um, had full-blown AIDS. Uh, she had tuberculosis, and her stomach was a little distended, and we discovered, uh, the nurses discovered the next day that she was three months pregnant. And these three factors had combined to cause the, the rapid metastasis of her, of her primary illness. And you, I, I don't know if you can see here, but there's, there were beads of sweat um, that would beat up as soon as I would wipe her brow when we were talking. Um, she had a, a severe fever, um, and yet she, ins she insisted that she wanted to record some of the details of her life. Um, as short as it was. And so I took those details. Um, when she was trafficked, when she was forced to work on the street, she was forced to work principally out of a hotel known as the Maitland Hotel, which had been taken over by the, the Nigerian crack, crack gangs. And um, there were three fo floors in this hotel that were dedicated to the operations of the of the gang. The others were dedicated, uh, were largely used by clients who would come and sleep with the girls. But the middle three floors of the hotel, um, the third floor was where the, um, where the girls slept, um, sometimes three to a mattress. Uh, the fourth floor was an illegal abortion clinic where a, uh, a Sangoma, a local healer, would come in and force abortions on the girls when, when, they, um, when they got pregnant. Uh, and the fifth floor was what they called the breaking grounds, um, which were the, um, uh, where, where new girls were sent to be gang raped, um, uh, to be broken in. Uh, and if they resisted, they would be thrown out of that uh, window, um, as, as two of them uh, were, one of whom I interviewed, who survived the fall, uh, wound up in a, um, in a rehabilitation center, was scared for her life, but still talked to me. Um, the other of whom uh, uh, died. Um, and so Sindiswa, whose name, by the way, means, um, means saved in Swahili, um, uh, told me her story. And um, after she told me her story, um, the person who had told me about her, who the only other person that knew outsider who knew where she was and that she was in this dire situation was a man you can't really see here. He's in the shadows. Um, I think I have a better shot of him uh, here. Um, a guy named Andre Lombard, who was a, uh, he was with the South African Special Forces for about 10 years. Um, he uh, learned how to, um, to do snatch and rescue operations. He learned how to, to kill uh, in the Special Forces. And fundamentally, he felt that so much of the work that he was doing was not applied to his pa passion, which was saving um, uh, young women and girls in danger. He developed this passion watching his father, uh, who was a brutal drunk, uh, beat, his, beat his mother uh, nearly to death um, and feeling powerless to do anything about it. He joined the Special Forces at, at 17, left home. Um, when I encountered him, he'd left the Special Forces, and he was a street pastor. And what he would do is he would go out, and he would train other street pastors to, to, to work with these girls to, to help um, get them to some kind of uh, safety. He would pass out blankets. He would pass out food. Um, and he would encourage them to, to leave. And many of them were too scared to go because of the, the threats, the real threats, and the executed threats in many, in many cases that the traffickers had leveled against them. Um, but Andre uh, himself was fearless. Um, he allowed his street pastors to carry weapons, um, which, you know, I tend, tend towards pacifism, um, and I, I was, um, uh, I, I often think that Violence should be an absolute last option. Um, but he had direct experience where one of his street pastors who was resisting, um, by the way, can, can we turn the lights down just a tiny bit? You might be able to see some of these. Um, uh, it's, it's no problem if not. But um, um, uh, these traffickers who were resisting, um, well, that's, that's great. That's great. OK. Um, that's perfect. Um, 
uh, these traffickers who were resisting him would go after the um, would go after his street pastors. And in one case, uh, a street pastor uh, was standing in the street after shutting down a brothel, um, and a trafficker came up behind him with a sharpened bicycle spoke, and ran it through his lungs, and pulled it out. And um, this is a big guy, and he died choking like a dog on the streets. Is the way is the way Andre put it. And so after that, he allowed his his pastors to, to wear weapons. Um, we were, um, Andre, after we interviewed Sindiswa, said to me, where is the trafficker? And the question was definitely more declarative than it was interrogative. It was clear to me that at that point he intended to go out, and, and it was near midnight, um, but he intended to go out and he intended to find where the trafficker was. And so we went to the Maitland. Um, and as we were shooting um, uh, in front of the Maitland and, and um, talking to individuals to try to find this trafficker, we only had his nom de guerre. We only had his, um, his uh, uh, sort of uh, his code name, um, uh, which was Jude. He went by the name Jude. Um, uh, and we were talking to, to girls in front of the Maitland and try, try, seeing if any of them knew Jude. And they knew Jude, but they obviously were, were scared to, to, to say where, where he was. Um, my photographer um, took this picture. And this is actually at the corner of the Maitland. The, Ma the Maitland is, is just over here. Um, but she was standing on, on, on the corner, this, this girl. And she, she stood out to me because... Um, both because of uh, her red jumper and also because she was wearing open-toed um, uh, flip-flops. It was uh, zero degrees that night. It was freezing. Um, and uh, she looked very cold and very alone and very young. And I, I went up to her and I asked. She didn't speak much English, but, but I could ask her three questions and she could respond. First question was, how old are you? And she said, 15 years old. Um, and where are you from? And she said, Eastern Cape. Uh, and I said, do you need help? And she said, yes, desperately. Um, it turns out that, um, I know at this point I should say, we have seen between 30 and 40 um, girls and women on the streets in desperate situations, working, uh, work, clearly working in prostitution. Many of them huddled together in two or three uh, um, uh, on street corners. Jeeps would pull up. She was one of the only ones that we saw alone, um, but she was the first one that we that we spoke to about, or that I spoke to about her situation. And she, uh, it just so it just happened that at this point I I brought over a, a translator who could speak to her in Osa, which was her native language, um, and uh, it turns out that this girl was the best friend of Sindiswa the girl that we'd seen earlier that night um, dying in a hospice alone. And um, my photographer, who is much more religious than me, said, you know, this is, this is the hand of God here. We've got to do something. Um, and as a journalist, again, you operate under certain rules, um, some of which are written, some of which aren't. But, but the overarching principle is that you want to observe, you want to report, you don't want to meddle with the individuals that you're finding. But in a situation like this where you have a 15-year-old girl um, who is asking for help and you've seen the, the outcome, um, you've seen her future graphically, um, uh, if you don't help, you get involved. And so uh, my, uh, my photographer and I talked to, um, talked to Andre, talked to the girl and said, you know, can you, um, we'll, we'll help get you out. And she was terrified because the trafficker had convinced her that he had, um, through muti magic, as she said, um, that he would track her. And she tried to run away three times, and each time the trafficker had, had found her. And that was, that was, it was to me obvious that he'd found her th um, by leveraging his network and he was very closely tied to the police, for example. Some of, the, some of her clients were police, so she knew that she couldn't run to police. She, she didn't feel like she could trust anybody. Um, 
And, but to her, he had convinced her that he had placed a spell on her clothes and on her, on her possessions, and that he would track her, finding her, using her possessions. And so she said, I have to get my stuff out. Um, we're, we're running a little short on time, and I want to I be able to um, work in um, uh, questions, uh, questions into the discussion here. Um, so I, I don't mean to leave you hanging, but if you want, if you want the full story, it's on time.com. It's free. Um, and uh, the short, um, short version is we got, it, we got her out. It wasn't without a fight, um, a physical fight. Um, we got her out. Uh, we got her to safety. Uh, we put her in a shelter um, uh, 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 where she was um, uh, she could be cared for anonymously. Um, that was uh, some uh, nine hour drive away from Bloemfontein. Um, and we went and I found her mother. Um, this is where her mother uh, lived. Um, this is actually this is where Cindy or sorry where I call the second girl Elizabeth. That's not her real name. Um, but this is where Elizabeth was born. This is where her mother was living at the time. Um, uh, that was how her mother prepared food. Um, and um, that's her mother. And um, uh, I found a, a couple um, in Chicago uh, who sponsored her school. Uh, it was some 160, 165 for uh, a year for uh, books, for um, uniform, uh, and for tuition. Um, she's uh, back in school. Um, uh, it's a stretch to call her lucky given what she went through, given the fact that she was raped multiple times a day, given the trauma that will presumably be with her for the rest of her life. But she's HIV negative. And she has another chance at life. Um, and uh, for that, I think, I think she is very lucky. Um, so um, let me just end um, by, before we open this up for conversation, I hope you'll have lots of questions about how to get involved. But um, by encouraging you all to get involved, um, this is a fight that we need not feel uh, powerless in in affecting change. You you may have noticed throughout this, I've uh, I've put in some of the prices of slaves and some of the um, uh, some of the the prices of of redemption. Um, I have a principle um, of not paying for human life, uh, and this was something that was um, uh, uh, it wasn't an automatic uh, uh, principle that I that I adopted, but it was something that I adopted after talking to shelter operators after talking to uh, people that do the, the daily work, the, the, the quiet heroes who aren't standing in front of audiences but are right now putting their lives on the line to get slaves out and to keep them free. And uh, every single one of them who had been dedicated to this for a number of years said, do not pay for human life. Do not buy these slaves out in order to free them. You will only be giving rise to a trade in human misery. And as a journalist and as um, a spokesperson for the issue, although that's never what I sought to be, um, you, will be, you will be broadcasting to the world that this is the way to end the problem. And the problem with redemption, as it's called, buying, buying slaves in order to give them their freedom, is that if we were to go and buy all 300,000 slaves out of Haiti, uh, the next year there would be 600,000 because we would be injecting hard currency into a transaction that is often a bartered transaction, we would be giving rise to a trade, really, in human misery. Um, and that's, that's a, uh, from a theoretical standpoint, that's a very easy thing to understand. Um, from a hard, um, uh, 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 from a hard realist standpoint, when you're standing in front of a, uh, a girl, as I was in Bucharest, um, who was being offered to me by a trafficker, by a, a Roma trafficker, um, who this girl had the visible effect of Down syndrome. Um, she had scars all over one of her arms where she would, had been trying to kill herself to escape daily rape. And the trafficker had put makeup on her, and she was crying so hard that the uh, makeup had run. 
she was offered to me in trade for a used car. The temptation in that situation is to go and get that used car and to reward the trafficker in the ice lump, but to get that girl out. Um, the, the hard reality is the only way to do this sustainably, the only way to get not only that girl out, but to prevent other girls from being trafficked into that situation is to arrest the trafficker, um, to make sure that that trafficker serves 20 years in prison. Um, and that's why, again, I applaud Texas for, for their steps today, increasing the, 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 the penalties for human traffickers. Um, but um, so in, in this case with Elizabeth, uh, in addition to getting her out, we launched a police investigation, or I um, uh, pressed the police to launch an investigation. I found a, a very good detective and a very good lieutenant who took this on, despite the fact that there's no law against human trafficking. Um, there, is laws, there are laws against crack dealing, um, and Elizabeth was willing to turn evidence against, against the, uh, the human trafficker. And so um, he is now a fugitive, and others in his network have been arrested, and they're serving time. Um, that's, that, that's a good outcome. Um, but I think the, um, uh, the, the sad fact is not enough people know about this crime and to begin with. Um, not enough people know that when a girl is working in, in prostitution, uh, a child is working in prostitution, that child is actually a victim. That child is not a perpetrator of a crime against the state. That child is a victim of a crime against humanity. And it is all of our responsibility to help her get out. Because the, 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 grim, the grim reality is if we don't say anything, if we pretend like that isn't our issue, uh, the grim reality is that that child may very well wind up in a situation like Sindiswa. Um, so very briefly, um, steps to getting involved. And this is, um, uh, this is something, again, that I think um, all of us have a, a, a responsibility to, to press for. Um, uh, on, on my website, uh, crimesomonstrous.com, there are a couple of very good organizations that I, I've worked with that work in the international sphere um, to, to not only free slaves, but to make sure that they become sustainably free, to stay with them for three to five years in some cases, to stay with their communities, to make sure, again, we don't botch abolition this time. We do it right. And, and we make sure that those individuals that, that we help bring to freedom stay free and implant the idea of freedom in their communities. Um, the, the two organizations that I list there are Free the Slaves and Anti-Slavery International, the American and British wings, respectively, of the oldest human rights organization in the world. Um, and um, beyond that, um, pressing uh, at home here uh, for, for, to affect real change in our communities um, begins not only with, again, caring for, for those that, that we may think of as, as you know, perpetrators of, of uh, crimes against common decency or, or, or whatever terms you'd, you'd like to employ, dealing with them instead as human beings, as, as victims seeking out the humanity and, and, and asking if they're okay. Not paying for sex um, is an obvious one, um, but a, a critical element is fundamentally uh, asking questions of those who, who may be in, in, in need. Um, and I'm presuming a few of you speak Spanish, and, and if you have Spanish language skills, the, the number one um, uh, country from which trafficking victims uh, enter the United States is, is Mexico. You know, not every, every person who's here without documentation um, is a trafficking victim. But those who, who are here without documentation are particularly vulnerable. Um, and if we, again, deal with undocumented workers as if they are, first and foremost, perpetrators of a crime against the state, we, we may be missing that they are, in fact, victims of a crime against humanity. And we may be, thus, complicit with the traffickers. So um, working on, on those scores, working with the, the Houston Alliance and the Texas Alliance against, uh, against human trafficking, um, pushing, I think, for, for better legislation at the federal level. And, 
And um, uh, Senator Cornyn and I may not agree on a lot of things, but I, I do appreciate um, Senator Cornyn's uh, uh, leadership on human trafficking. Um, uh, he's mainly been focused on sex trafficking. Um, I'd like to see him focus on other forms of trafficking because, as I mentioned at the beginning, a, uh, uh, you know, somebody that is forced to, to work in a quarry um, uh, and a child that is forced to work in a domestic uh, labor situation uh, is, is subject to the same kinds of violence and, in the case of the child working in the domestic labor situation, the same kinds of sexual abuse that uh, a, a, a victim of, uh, of sex slavery uh, would endure. Um, there is a, there's a very good uh, bill that's been passed in California, and I'd love to see something similar in Texas. Um, the bill in California essentially says that any company doing over $100 million of, of global business has got to analyze their, their supply chains um, and publicly disclose what they've, uh, that, that they have analyzed the supply chains to make sure there's no slavery in, in the products that we're buying. And I want you to pause for a moment and think about, uh, think about cell phones, think about uh, the shirts that you're wearing, think about things that you probably have on you right now, and think about if you know where the elements of those products actually come from, where the components of those products come from. Do you know where the cotton came from? Could it have been harvested by forced child slaves in Uzbekistan every, every harvest season, every fall? Uh, the government of Uzbekistan forces children out of schools to harvest cotton that is then sold on the open, or open markets. And it may very well wind up in the shirts that you're wearing. Uh, in your cell phones, there is there's something called a transponder. A transponder is made with a, a trace metal called coltan. And one of the two largest producers of coltan is the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Both rebel and government run mines in the Congo, use slave laborers to mine that coal tan that may be in your cell phone today. The fact is we as consumers have the right to know what's going into our products, and we as, as consumers have the, have the right to demand and make, uh, and the, I think the responsibility to make choices based on uh, how corporations do in terms of uh, in terms of keeping their supply chains clean, so that's the, the uh, that's why the California bill is so good, and I was in Washington last week um, pushing for uh, for federal legislation on this. It would be terrific to see um, a Texas senator uh, co-sponsoring that legislation, particularly as they're both Republicans and and there is some pushback from the business lobby on this, um, uh, but. Uh, fundamentally, all of us have a role to play, um, whether it's deciding what to, to buy or what not to buy, or getting involved at a deeper level and, and, and volunteering for one of these organizations, shadowing activists, shadowing uh, lawyers, uh, civil rights attorneys uh, that are pushing uh, for prosecutions of trafficking victims, um, uh, getting involved at a, at a deep level. Um, so before I um, open it up for questions, and we have about 20 minutes for 10, 10, 10 15 minutes for, for a discussion after this. Um, but I just I want to leave you with a thought. And this was a thought from the, um, uh, one of my heroes, Henry David Thoreau, who was uh, a great uh, American abolitionist, environmentalist, and pacifist. And he was... He was running head of the pacifism and the abolitionism were, were crashing into each other in 1860, uh, 1861. And he was writing to a friend of his um, two days before the first shots were fired at Fort Sumter, two days before the Civil War started. And he could tell that there was this rumbling disunion. And the friend had been reading reports of that and, and reports of slavery in the New York Herald, um, the New York Herald Tribune. And he wrote to this friend and he said, uh, if you know of it, you're particeps criminis. You're a partner in the crime. What business have you if you're an angel of light to be pondering over the deeds of darkness? And he meant that 
as an admonition, as a warning. And, and I took it, and I hope all of you take it, as, as a call to arms, as an exhortation, as a call to get involved. And so with that, I'll open it up for discussion, and we can talk about ways to do that. Thank you. Do you, do you want to? Uh, yeah, I guess I have a, please. I have a few comments and a question. Please. So I want to thank you because I know from firsthand experience um, that this is physically taxing, emotionally draining, and intellectually almost infuriating to do this kind of work. And I, I know my students are probably back there going, wow, someone else is sounding like God. But um, <laughs> I, I talk about these things in my argument class, and um, there's a real disconnect. I know that you've mm. praised Texas as far as legislature is concerned. Yeah. And I know that my government colleagues have done a wonderful job as far as addressing human rights as well. Mm. But there's a real disconnect, um, you know, about working with human rights issues. It's, it's almost like they don't exist, you know, yeah. or, or we're, we've become so isolationist um, as Americans that, you know, well, if there's anything outside of our national borders, we don't want to hear about it. But yet you really brought it home how this connects with our community. Um, I know in class this semester we've talked about um, sweatshops like Forever 21 being busted in yeah. So I want to thank you so much for bringing such relevance because the days of writing and arguing about school uniforms are over. This, this is a real issue. There are more slaves today than ever before in human history. Mm. And so those, those are my comments. And I'd like to invite any of you that would like to stop by my office in DC 17. I will help you get involved to whatever um, extent you want to get involved as far as, as putting an end to um, human trafficking. Um, also, last year I worked with Mike Hume Hall and Mike. Oh, terrific, yeah. I was going to ask you if you, I'm sure you've run into those groups. Absolutely, yeah. And when I was in the Mighty McCall office in Kathmandu, um, I spoke with uh, the, the general director and, um, and also got to meet some of the children who, are, who were being trafficked. But um, they were basically saying that it was very difficult to go in and, and extract more than one person. Mm. That sometimes when the parents report their children missing, that they're able to go in and extract that child mm. as far as saving the whole group of slaves, it's very difficult. And so I was wondering if you could speak to that. Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you for, for your advocacy on this. And it's, it's terrific. I, I can sleep a little bit easier knowing that, there's, that you all have a place to direct your energies now. Uh, I, I, oh, absolutely! Yeah, I've, 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 I've heard the name. Uh, terrific. Um, the um, uh, to your first point, I while I uh, while I praise Texas vis-a-vis -vis other states, um, unfortunately, that's not saying very much um, because most states don't have um, anything anything near a robust strategy to combat human trafficking, or anyway, uh, a, a robust implemented strategy to combat human trafficking. Um, uh, on, a, on a federal level, across all programs, domestic and international, the amount of money that the United States spends to fight the traffic in human beings on an annual basis in one year is as much as we is actually less than we spend on a daily basis to fight the traffic in illegal drugs, uh, and that's not to diminish the relative horrors of smoking pot. Um, Seriously, it's actually it's not to diminish the relative horrors of the drug trade that that that, that um, and the commensurate violence, but it is to say which is a more monstrous crime: is it a 15-year-old being sold for rape and destruction on the street corner, or is it a 15-year-old selling pot on the street corner? Um, and I think unless we ask our legislators, and we have the power in this room to do that, um, unless we ask our legislators about those questions of priority then we will continue on the course as a country as we've been continuing and and I think um, we can do better um, but um, uh, to your point about mighty Nepal that's that's terrific I know um, Anuradha quite well um, uh, Anuradha Koirala who if any of you saw the CNN Heroes uh, program she was the hero of the year um, and um, I think extremely well deserved. Um, the the strategy that they adopt, I think, is it's a difficult one, but um, for the moment, it's the best one we we have, which is um, 
uh, they they go to police. Um, they they encourage them to 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 get involved in, in situations where they can trust police. If they can't trust police, then they then they go around them. Um, but uh, fundamentally, they also um, leverage the the knowledge and the passion um, and frankly the bravery of survivors um, to prevent other victims from becoming victims um, and uh, training uh, at border posts um, and um, and uh, and also not only prevention but but rehabilitation and pr pr protection they, they they leverage the capacity and the the the, the drive of survivors I think there is um, for the moment, there is no easy solution on this. And the problem when you're dealing with both India and Nepal is that, um, and more so at in, in India's case, you have very good federal laws. You have, um, you have a great will on the part of the federal government, um, uh, on the part of the Supreme Court, et cetera, to, um, to you know, put those laws in place and make sure that they're protected in case after case. But at the district and at the panchayat level, where you're talking about extremely poor populations, um, you're talking about um, uh, police officials in many cases that are that are grossly corrupt because um, they're getting paid a lot more by the traffickers um, or by the sand mafias than they are by the district magistrate to enforce the laws, and so it's a um, um, you know I, I think part of this has got to be worked into. Um, uh, India's strategy as it as it attempts to develop, um, uh, and it's it has to be you know seen not only as a moral issue. I think we have to, it's important to see this as a moral issue, but we have to get past that as well, particularly when you're dealing with India, and and frame it as a development issue because. Also, education is an issue. You don't get the rules if you start educating them. And Absolutely. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. And that's just another strategy. Yeah. Not only trying to get to them when it's too late, but trying to get to them before it happens. Right. And, you know, the solution to this is not necessarily to, you know, send every, every former slave to college, but it is to make sure that they can, they can determine their own future. They can, um, they have the opportunity to make uh, even, uh, even a little bit of money. And I, I, was, I was just beginning to make the, the development argument as well. Something remarkable happens when, um, when you free slaves and keep them sustainably free. Um, the, the communities that um, had hitherto been in bondage then begin to be more productive. Um, they begin to contribute tax revenue. Um, and, they're, and they begin to actually buy things. A slave will not buy anything because a slave doesn't own property. A slave, um, uh, de facto, if not de jure, is property, him or herself. But somebody making just $2 a day will eventually buy things. And so there's an up cycle of development there. And um, you know, take the high-end estimate for slaves in the world today. The high-end estimate is about 27 million slaves in the world today. The estimates begin at 12.3 million and go up to 27 million. But let's say it's 27 million. The amount of money that Free the Slaves has determined um, through its programs across various continents, and there's cross-indexing here. It costs a lot more to free a slave in the United States than it does in India. But the amount of money on average is about $400 per slave to keep a slave free for between three to five years to um, uh, train them, to rehabilitate them, to give them and their communities the tools needed to, to implant sustainable freedom. Um, you multiply $400 out by 27 million, and we're talking about 10 to $11 billion, um, which sounds like a lot of money until you consider what 10 to $11 billion uh, is and what we spend 10 to $11 billion on as Americans. <laughs> Um, you know, a month ago, we were spending uh, uh, 10 to 11 billion dollars on chocolate and roses on Valentine's Day. Um, I think, frankly, uh, a much more redeeming uh, way of showing our love 
would be to free every slave on earth and to keep them free. Um, it's something that we can do. Or it's, at least by fair trade chocolate. Or at least by fair trade chocolate, exactly. Um, and, um, and, you know, I think that this is a change that we can affect within our lifetimes, but it really takes the people in this room getting active and doing something about it. Please. Um, why does a crime of such severity only get 20 years? That's an excellent question. Um, and in many cases, it gets much, it gets much less than that. Um, you, we would think a crime that involves rape, that involves torture, that in many cases involves murder, um, would get 20 years and uh, would get more than 20 years in prison. Part of the reason is because um, prosecutors will charge. Uh, trafficking and other offenses. So if rape is involved, they'll charge rape as well. If um, a murder is involved, they'll charge, charge murder as well. But I, I frankly think it should be uh, much heftier sentences. You're talking about essentially, um, you know, as the, as the Haitians say, killing somebody without actually killing them, turning them into a zombie. Um, and, um, and I think that the, the sentences should be much more severe. But they're not yet, um, not, not without our advocacy. Thank you. Thank you.